It's the front line of climate change, the Arctic. Temperatures are rising three times the global average, melting ice, damaging vital ecosystems and causing sea levels to rise. But it's not just a problem for the region, it's a problem for the whole planet. So why is it melting so fast and how can the Arctic be saved? I am Warren Ettleford and this is what you need to know. Hello and welcome to today's episode of What You Need to Know. I'm joined now by our science correspondent, Martin Stew, and our science producer, Phil Sine, who are currently in the Arctic. They drew the short straw and were sent there by ITV News to cover this story in the northernmost settlement in the world, in the town of Nyulasund, with scientists who are studying climate change. Now, Martin and Phil, what can you tell us about this? Yeah, not too bad a gig, is it? Uh, we've actually just arrived in, in Longnibarn, which is the sort of the bigger town on the island of Svalbard, part of Norway, right up in the Arctic Circle, 79 degrees, well, actually 78 degrees north here, where we were in the Olesund, as you mentioned, nearly 79 degrees north. And that's this kind of outpost village, whatever you want to call it, that's as remote as it is remarkable. Uh, it was originally set up for coal mining, little wooden huts, people extracting coal. And now the people who live there are scientists and they're, they're mining for data, particularly about what burning that coal, amongst other things, is doing to our climate. And Phil, it's, it's a real like um, international place, isn't it? Amazingly so. It's truly, truly unique. There are 10 countries there um, and all the scientists there, they socialise together, they eat together and they share resources as well because it's all about the science. Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic place. So we were hosted uh, by... Uh, British Antarctic Survey, but also the British Arctic base. They've got a permanent base out there and they're doing all this different work to try and get a hand on exactly what's happening with the climate. OK, and they're all working together, these different teams. Uh, now, as I understand, uh, in August, Svalbard uh, recorded its warmest ever August. Does that match with what you've seen? Yeah, I mean, I think so. It, it's really difficult with all these climate things because obviously there's long term trends and you know, we've had many ice ages and things fluctuate all the time. What scientists there say is that things are just happening so fast and at such a great scale, it is completely different to everything that's happened in the past. And you could sort of get a sense of that by looking at this amazing geology around you. So if you look around the kind of the hills and mountains surrounding these glaciers, which are melting slowly or fast in this case, actually, they'll have been shaped over millions of years. And you can see these crazy layers and the rocks and geologists are able to piece together history from these layers and the rocks. And they can tell that change has happened. You know, there's been more ice, there's been less ice. But the speed now is going to be different to what we've seen in the past. And so, Phil, this speed that it's happening at, are scientists now even more alarmed because of this? I think there's alarm. And I think there's also uh, a sense of sadness because a lot of them dedicate their careers to studying this decades and decades. And they've been coming here for decades and they've watched it slowly and now quickly in some cases. Uh, change the glaciers retreat. So I think they, they see the beauty here and they see it being lost in many cases. I mean, one of the scientists, a really nice guy called Kevin, he's been working in polar science for many years. Uh, previously was down in Antarctica and it used to be that he would fly, get flown in, land on a glacier, he'd then camp there, do his experiments and then he'd go back the next year or whatever, or however it may be. But the glacier melted so much they were no, able, no longer able to fly a plane there. He's now wow. in the north. He's um, This week he's just finished a 10-year project where they've essentially they've built these kind of mini greenhouses and what it does is he's looking at the plant inside the mini greenhouse and because it's inside a mini greenhouse it may be a degree or two warmer than outside and what he's looking at is the relationship between uh how the plants grow and also uh how the sort of the microbes in the soil change because as the snow and the ice melts we're going to get more of a greening of the arctic now from a layman's point of view, I was thinking, well, isn't that good? You, know, you get the plants, they're <laughs> going to absorb the carbon dioxide from the air. And he's saying, well, yes, there is that element. But also, as these fungi and various you know, microbes in the soil wake up, they potentially release carbon. And so what he's trying to understand is, is this going to be a net gain or a net drain for the planet as we see more things melting? So fascinating science happening. And he's seeing change happen you know, in front of his eyes. Now, regarding some of that change, as I understand, you got to stand on a 3,000-year-old glacier, which is under threat from rising temperatures. What was that like? Pretty cool, wasn't it, Phil? Very cool. <laughs> I think it's just the age of it as well. We saw a rock, which they estimated was, what, one billion? 
um, years old. Yeah, a, a billion years old. So it, it, it had been hidden under the glacier, released. Yeah, and, and because it's such an untouched place, it's a, you know, it's like a treasure trove for geologists to look at all these things. Um, and we walked up to the glacier actually from, from the fjord where originally many thousands of years the glacier would have ended. It retreated a long time ago, stopped, and then in the last sort of few decades has retreated back another sort of 500, maybe a maybe 1,000 meters and is moving back up the valley. And as you walk onto it, what you notice is it's, it's not as white as you might expect, especially around the edge. The, 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 the ice is becoming increasingly sort of black and it's got mud in it, it's got rocks. And there's something called the Albedo effect, which is essentially if you imagine uh, if you well, if you go on a hot day and you're wearing a black T-shirt, you feel warmer because the black absorbs the heat. You're wearing a white T-shirt, it bounces the heat off you. The same thing happens. If you lose the snow in the ice cover, the ground warms faster and it speeds that warming process up. The other thing was really interesting with Dorothea, who's a, a, an ice core scientist. And we were able to pick up bits of ice. And if you listen very carefully, you can hear this sort of slight popping. And what that is, is as it melts, it's releasing these bubbles of gas from the ice. Mm. Now, this glacier is around 3,000 years old. Some of that ice could be hundreds or thousands of years old. And if you can monitor what is in the gas in those bubbles, you know exactly what was in the environment. So if you can plot the temperature, say 200 years ago, with knowing how much carbon and other gases were in the environment at the time, you can see that correlation. Because a lot of people who are skeptical about man's impact on the way our planet is, cli is changing will say, yeah, but we, we have ice ages before. Things fluctuate. It is a natural rhythm. And what the scientists are saying is if you look, you know, Antarctica is an even better example. They can go drill into an ice core. And the further you drill, the deeper you go, the more into the past you head. So they could drill essentially back 800 thousand years and looking at the gas that would have been in the environment then they were always also able to tell when there were warmer climates based on the the density of the ice and what you can see over this very long graph is you have peaks of carbon in the air mm. and then followed by that you have the temperature warming and that happens again maybe you know several thousand years ten thousand years later and and, and the, the pattern repeats but when you zoom in to what we're looking at now the kind of the line that is the carbon is going up way faster and way higher than we've ever seen before recorded going back 800,000 years. And the temperature, while still not as warm as it has been in the past, is still going up. And that's the uncertainty. We do not know what's going to happen. So it's kind of, for me, it's the most compelling argument that what humans are doing is having an impact on our climate. And it's not just a natural fluctuation. So you're seeing all this evidence, you're seeing these time capsules. What's the mood like amongst the scientists who are there? Are they optimistic or, or are they not because of the evidence that they're uncovering? I mean, they're very rational, aren't they, Phil? It, it, it's not, uh, I think a large part of it is that they are really driven by data. You know, there's, there's so much kind of skepticism and politics around climate and people getting you know, emotionally involved. And what they want to do is provide irrefutable data that things are changing. I mean, Max was great, wasn't she? She's, a, I mean, to give you an idea of the international flavor, she's a Dutch scientist working for a German uh, research company based in Svalbard, which is owned by Norway. So yeah, it's, it's like a real kind of European mix. And you know, there are other scientists there we spoke to from India, Japan, China, and they're all sharing the data as well. Often scientists are a bit kind of cagey about not giving stuff away, sure. but they're like, no, it costs money. It costs carbon to get this data. Let's make it open source. Let's give everyone the chance to see what we're looking at. And Max actually was kind of, she wasn't completely uh, negative, was she? She was saying there is still hope, there is still time, but they just want to understand things. Um, what do you explain for what, what, what she was looking at? Well, they were looking at the, how temperature rise in the water affects fish and what that would mean for them. And so it's, it was just this real insight into something that you might not think about um, how that will affect them um, that you wouldn't even think is going on there. No, and, and so what they, what they do is they, they keep fish in, in different tanks at slightly different temperatures, maybe a degree warmer each. And then they really, they, she described it as, as a sort of a fitness test. So they're in a <laughs> tank swimming against the current and they make the current faster and faster and faster. And they are able to monitor how much oxygen is in the water because the harder the fish is working, the more oxygen it takes up out of the water. So they can see how difficult it is for fish to continue going about their daily basis in different climates. And the hypothesis is, as the water warms, it becomes more difficult and it puts them under more strain. The positive is, she's very early on, it appears a certain level of warming the fish are able to cope with. 
what they don't know is if the warming goes above that, and this is what she's now looking at, will it impact them? And th these are relatively small fish about the you know, length of your palm of your hand almost, which might not sound that exciting, but they're a key part of the food chain. So, you know, the, the narwhals eat them, the polar bears eat them. It, it's all kind of interconnected. All of the, the seals eat the fish and then the polar bears eat the seals. So it's all kind of interconnected and they're looking at how the changes may Im impact that sort of thing. Um, but she was saying, look, th there is some positivity. What her hope is, is that kind of, as she put it, everyone could just pull together and get stuff sorted before we cross tipping points that mean fish like these, other, other tipping points, can't, you, we can't go back on that. And Martin, just, uh, just before we end, um, I guess one thing I should ask you is, are these international scientists, and of course there are British ones there too, are they optimistic that we as humans can turn this around? Um, I think they're optimistic, although they think by knowing or by proving as far as they can that humans are impacting the changing climate, the reverse of that is, well, if we change our behavior, we can, we can affect it in the opposite direction. What, what I think they want is more, more awareness. They want better understanding of how things are changing and the impact we have. And the reason they've invited us up here, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a lot of effort to get here. It's, it costs money. It's a huge amount of, for them to do. It's because they want to show people what is changing. And it might feel really remote. And you might think I'm not that fussed if a polar bear struggles for a food source or, you know, these glaciers are miles away. But it's all interconnected. You know, the globe is interconnected. The island is far bad, it's around the size of Scotland. So compared to places like Greenland or the Antarctica, it's relatively small in polar terms. But if the glaciers on Svalbard melted, the global sea levels would go up 1.7 centimetres. So that's across the whole globe. Mm -hmm. Svalbard accounts for about 6% of glaciers in the world, excluding Greenland and Antarctica. So you can see it's a kind of a really good barometer. And because scientists have been coming here for 60 odd years now, they're starting to get longer term trends of seeing things change and they can make better projections going forward. So. I think they are uh, depressed by what they see, but they're also hopeful. And that's why they're doing the science. They're hopeful that they can make a difference. Martin and Phil, thank you so much for speaking to me just now. Really vital that you highlight these changes that are happening in such a precious and inaccessible place. Thank you very much and safe journey home. And thank you for listening. For more on this, tune in to ITV Evening News this Wednesday the 4th of September at 7pm. And have a look back through our other quick briefings on a range of headline topics to find out what you need to know. Until next time, thank you for listening.